Uh, thank you, Dean Attino. Uh, should we dim the lights a little bit more? So um, I'm going to start a little bit. I'm going to start this by talking a little bit about space and about the history of the um, theatrical space. Because as set designers, we, d we are space designers. And I think that later on, I'd love to talk a little bit about the, 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 the similarities in, 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 in the process of designing for the stage and for design in, uh, uh, at a school of engineering, designing industrial design. I think there's a, there's a very distinct common thread. And I'd love to talk about that a little later. And um, I recently um, started a, uh, a company and, uh, with another designer. And we primarily design museum exhibits. And we've been working um, very closely with the Mythbusters. Um, and we've actually found really a, a lot of common ground with these guys because they're engineers and they design, uh, uh, um, they design uh, apparatus that d d disputes d uh, uh, myths. But they also, um, they're also artists. So we designed this exhibit down at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. What I'd really like to start off with first, this is a, uh, uh, um, an artist representation of a Greek theater. Um, this is uh, 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 in Asia Minor. And what's really distinctive about this space is it has nothing to do with scenery. And it has everything to do with space. So the performers sat in this essentially an empty volume. And they had a building beyond it, which, which I'll show you a little later, um, evolved into something more uh, 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 more advanced and actually was able to accommodate different scenic elements. But essentially, it was an empty space. Um, the ar archaeologists archaeologist on some of the, uh, um, on these archaeological sites in, 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 in ancient Greece have found these elements in the ground. And what they, they believe they are is that they housed the points for um, periactoids, which were three-sided scenic elements. And so they believe that in those little frames upstage, um, uh, on the face of that building, they had these little pivoting elements that could change uh, uh, the, the, the scenery. But the, beyond that, it was all about the actors, and they had very minimal props. Um, and this is a, a, a photograph of a Greek theater. Um, as we moved into, uh, into the Roman theater, and this is actually a real whirlwind tour of, uh, of, of, of theater architecture, but um, bear with me. So what happened was is they actually started to enclose the space even more the performing area started to get smaller, and it became more and more about this upstage area called the Franz Skene. You can see that, um, which is that, that facade, that facade of, uh, uh, that detailed facade. So speeding through history into 1580, um, this is believed to be one of the first proscenium theaters. And, and, and the proscenium arch is the frame through which the audience looks through to, to, to various scenic elements. This was designed by Andre Palladio. He's a famous. Um, Italian architect. But so through there, there was actually a permanent scene. So you can see in this, this artist rendering, there was, a, there was actually permanent scenery up there. So the stage space started to evolve into, an air, into a space where there was, it wasn't just about the performers, it was also about some type of a surround. This is a, um, um, actually one of Palladio's uh, elevations for that, um, for the Teatro Olimpico. Um, OK, fast forward <laughs> to um, uh, th this is obviously, this is an Elizabethan theater. Um, I think this is, the, this is the Globe Theater, which they've actually reconstructed um, in, in, in London on the, on the banks of the Thames. You can see references to the, to, to, to the Roman theater. Uh, but essentially, uh, what happened is, is now it's actually been pushed back. There's a, there's a deeper st stage. And it's, but it's essentially about the performers. And all of the elements that you see were used throughout those um, productions of Christopher Marlowe and Ben Johnson and William Shakespeare. They used those um, um, doorways, and, and, and they used the balcony, and, they, and then the trap. They reused them for every, every, um, every production. They were very minimal scenic elements. It was essentially about the performers. Um, that's actually, that's the, uh, on the banks of the Thames. That's the recreation of the Globe Theater in London. Um, they had some minimal documentation of it. And they also were able to find elements of the old globe. And it, it, uh, um, they excavated them. So they actually knew the size. Uh, they knew the general dimensions of the theater. And what's interesting to me, this is supposed to be an accurate depiction of what it used to be. It's, you know, we have these, these images from Shakespeare in Love and these other movies of it being this kind of worn wood, very kind of this uh, rather idyllic. It was kind of cheesy. 
It was all kind of scene painted. It was a little gaudy. I mean, actually, uh, uh, um, our artisans, the theater artists back then had kind of the reputation of carnies. It was a little bit, it wasn't necessarily the most respectable profession. Um, that's a photo I took inside there. Okay, fast, uh, th 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 this is a Baroque theater. Um, this is in Chesky Kremlot. This is in the Czech Republic. Um, and what's interesting is that um, this was a, uh, uh, um, this, this particular theater was entombed in a castle for 200 years and nobody was there, no one dis disturbed it. So it's actually completely intact and all of, the, all, of the, all of the scenic painting and all the props and the costumes were completely restored and you can actually visit this space in the Czech Republic. And it's all automated and they had all of this uh, uh, you know, uh, um, automation that there's this center kind of a pole down the middle that they turned it and it brought scenery in and it, and it was very much about, and this is the actual images of the of this. And there was a, a, a very detailed uh, sense of perspective, but that was only really visible from the center box because the king or the, or the high ranking, uh, the royalty would sit in the box and it was all for them. If you sat on the side, it was kind of distorted some of that perspective. But then it was, and this was uh, um, one of their wave machines, but it was very much of a, of, of a, of, um, we're starting to move toward pictorial, more pictorial realism in, 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 in design. So we started in the Greek theater and it was very simple and it started, we've started to evolve into actually more uh, illustrative settings. Um, so this is a, 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 toward the end of the 19th century, uh, Dushenko and, and, and Konstantin Chekhov founded the Moscow Art Theater. And the Moscow Art Theater, um, their, their, their mission was in reaction to the vaudeville um, uh, um, uh, design aesthetic in, 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 that had permeated Russia and, and Europe through, uh, through the end of the, the, the 19th century. But they wanted to create a, a, um, um, a style of theater that was very real, that depicted um, life in Russia at the time. In a very, so they hired this, uh, uh, um, um, their designers to do these very, very pictorial, naturalistic settings. I and mean, this was one of the, um, uh, um, the renderings of one of the stage sets for Three Sisters. Um, by, by Anton Chekhov, and all of Chekhov's plays um, were produced at the Moscow Art Theater. So this is what materialized out of these renderings. Is th this to them was, was, was absolute naturalism. This is as far close to naturalism as they could get um, at that time with their technology and their, and their, and their scenic techniques. If by today's standards, not ultimately very realistic, but with the interior scenes, they were actually to, uh, able to get a little bit more um, evolved. But this was, what happened was that this type of, of design, this pictorial, realistic, um, replete design, um, permeated, especially in this country, at the beginning of the 20th century. If you saw pretty much everything on Broadway was pictorial realism, box sets, um, with a frame around it, and everything was very real. Then you brought guys onto the scene like Adolf Appia, who was a Swiss uh, imaginer, and, and he uh, uh, never really designed that much professionally, but he thought about design in a completely different way. And he thought about, well, what if we stripped away all the garnish and we just had these raw spaces? And it was the performers that brought these things to life. To life. Um, and uh, so he, he designed these spaces that were, were way out there in, ter in terms of, because this was happening when naturalism was at its height. Um, and a lot of this stuff evolved out of the, out of the, out of, out of artistic thinking at the, uh, at the you know, 19th century uh, with symbolism and, and, and other, where people were not depicting reality in their, in their artwork, they were depicting what people dreamt about. This is another one of his designs. So blasting forward. Robert Edmund Jones, uh, um, American designer, he designed a lot of, uh, uh, pretty much all of Eugene O'Neill's premieres. He wrote a book called The Dramatic Imagination, which, is the, which I consider to be the Bible of, 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 of theater design. Published in 1941. Um, and in it he talks about, he says, our playwrights too have begun to explore this land of dreams. And it was in reference ultimately to the symbolist art movement in Europe uh, um, and, uh, of the 19th century. And it was a reaction against realism. And he talked about clothing the ideal in a, in, in a perceptible form. We can only hint at absolute truths that can only be hinted at indirectly. So ultimately what he's saying is that 
when you take something and you put it on stage, you can't take a big chunk of the world and put it up there and, and ex expect it to do what it needs to do. You need to adjust it. You need to modify it. That is the hand of the artist. And these are some, uh, um, just Klimt was, all, was, was a well-known um,